Good evening. Uh, it's great to be here. Really, really thrilled to be the first speaker in this series. Um, I want to start with some audience research. Put up your hands if you were working in 1990. Put up your hands if you weren't yet working. So commiseration to all you fellow oldies. Uh, 1990, I began a job at the Council for the Protection of Rural England as the Energy and uh, Natural Resources Campaigner. And uh, I was very young and enthusiastic and, and, uh, and committed to the cause. I certainly didn't wear a grey suit, let alone a tie. Um, and I was determined to use my communications and other skills to, to change the world for the better. And in 1991, with that in mind, we, we published a report written by an academic called Susan Owens from Cambridge University. You may, you may know Susan. Um, called Energy Conscious Planning. And Susan's report argued very cogently that the thing we needed to do above all was to use the land use planning system to create environments that enable people to guess what, walk, cycle, and use public transport. And then uh, we published a whole series of other well-argued, well-researched, well-documented reports arguing roughly the same thing from a variety of different points of view, the health benefits, the environmental benefits, uh, the, the cost benefits of producing these sorts of uh, modes of transport, making them easy to use and safer to use and so on. Uh, so wind forward a bit, uh, I moved to the Pedestrians Association um, in 1997. Uh, and 1998, I commissioned a report from the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Tropical Medicine about the health and economic benefits of children being able to walk to school. Lots of footnotes about the health benefits and the epidemiological research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, of course, was, was uh, very influential on the debate. Um, Move forward again, uh, and we produced a whole set of reports, the Living Streets uh, and other organisations, again, about the benefits of walking, cycling, uh, and why it was a good idea to, to have these as part of city design and so on and so forth. Now, what points am I making by making that kind of historical uh, account? Well, first is I'm much older than I look. I'm actually 74, but obviously <laughs> cycling is very good for health. But the second point I want to make is the reason why it's taken quite a while for active travel to get properly on the ag agenda has nothing to do with the lack of evidence. This is not a factual problem, right? We have masses of evidence, all of which I'm sure you're very familiar with, about why it's good to get cities uh, organised around walking, cycling, and, and supported that by public transport. It's a much more subtle political and institutional problem. I'll come back to that in a second. So this is not a factual problem we, we've had historically, although I think the problem is starting to, 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 to go away very usefully. So in 2000, to continue this personal odyssey, I, I, I got a Churchill Fellowship when I was running Living Streets to go and look at cities in Scandinavia and, and the states that had seemed to be doing the right thing around the public realm and walking and, and, and urban design. And the question I was posing to officials and academics in those cities was, what is it about these cities that means that they are creating these environments, which in a variety of different ways, which you'll all be familiar with, were, were conducive to public space, were supportive of dwell, dwelling, were, were supportive of the local economy, were encouraging walking cycles, and so on and so forth. And there were three things that were true about them. The first was the politics in those cities was directly supportive of those sorts of environments. So in, in Portland, Oregon, for example, there was a mayor called Neil Goldschmidt, elected in about 1974, who began the process of turning Portland into a city, unlike many other cities in the States, that was very much around transit, walking, cycling, public realm, uh, high-quality urban design. Uh, in Copenhagen, it was a series of socialist mayors who began the cycling revolution, uh, again in the early 1970s. So the politics, and particularly the politics of elected mayors or, or, or senior politicians, were absolutely fundamental to creating these sorts of making these environments possible. The second thing that was true was that the institutions in those cities, as a result of the political lead provided by these elected mayors, normally they were elected mayors, began to reorient what they did, what they valued, what they measured, what they spent money on, how they trained their staff, what the seniority was organised around. So when you go to talk to cities in Amsterdam and, and, and Copenhagen and, and, and Groningen, you will find senior people thinking and talking about walking, cycling, public realm as a matter of course. So the institutions gradually start to reorient themselves, and I know there are colleagues from local government here in London, where the institutions start, not, not surprised, to follow the lead set by the politicians and start to change the way that they think what their default setting is. And then the third thing that happens is that the choice environment, so you have a political environment, you have an institutional environment, then you have a choice environment in which people make decisions about what they do, how they get their kids to school, how they shop, how they move around the city, starts to support the sorts of outcomes that the politicians said they want that the institutions then orient themselves to deliver. And the great thing about this is that these are all dynamically interrelated, right? So if you have a series of politicians who say, I want this city to be a different sort of city, the institutions start to orient themselves around that, 
it creates the environment where people start to make those choices and of course that becomes part of the political cycle and then you get this becomes part of what that city does that's what the city is about that's how the city sells itself internationally so if you look around the world certainly in the UK and Europe you will, I think you will find a dynamic cycle whereby and it normally starts with the politics whereby you get that dynamic feedback between the politicians and the, and the political system and not just the politicians either the people who influence the politicians the institutions that politicians preside over and, and, and the physical environment that people use. So let's run forward to London 2013. I've been at TfL since 2002, and I went there from living streets in a slightly a sort of odd sideways career move. And it was very interesting going from outside the system to being inside the system and looking out from a big bureaucracy and seeing how the world looks when you're inside it, trying to, trying to do lots of different things in, in a quite a high-profile political environment. So let's see where we are in London. I'd be interested to debate whether people share my views. So the politics, I think, around access travel in London are now looking, I think, pretty good. Um, we've had two mayors, uh, and the, I think the mayoralty is a significant part of this, um, who have made a commitment in various weight shapes, weight shapes and forms to a combination of walking, cycling, the public realm, road safety, all the things that, that make these things uh, more attractive and, and less difficult to do. There's no doubt at all that the institutions, plural in London, uh, that need to deliver these things have changed very significantly, and colleagues from London government may want to comment on this, but certainly TfL is unrecognisable from when I first went there in 2002 in terms of the priorities of the senior management, who is engaged in the debate about active travel. So I off, I've said this in other conferences, when I first went to TfL, the most senior person whose job it was to do walking and cycling was two layers below my position in the very hierarchical structure that TfL has. And now there are 10 or 11 directors, which is the level that I'm at, who are contributing to that, that agenda. So the third part of this is we're now creating an environment in London. So the institutions are changing, I think that's true local government. We're now creating an environment in London which over time incrementally is changing the infrastructure, is changing the price incentives, is changing the, the, the view and perception of these modes, uh, both outside TfL but also within it and the other institutions. And we're creating an environment where walking, cycling become the thing that you would choose to do rather than something that, that, that you would do because you have some kind of prior commitment to that as a, as a political or, or a cultural issue. So I think in London what we're seeing, and again people may or may not agree, is we're seeing this dynamic kicking in now. It takes a while. These things don't happen very quickly because big organisations take a long time to, to change what they do and think. So I think I want to conclude with, with these three thoughts which really relate to my, my model. One is that, in the end, it all starts with the politics, whether it's uh, all of us here from the LC, whether it's the LCC putting political pressure on the elected mayor and the boroughs, whether it's developers saying what we want is a different kind of city is to support our developments and keep London growing. The institutions both lead and support the politics, so the organisations start to change what they do and think and how they prioritise things and who does what at a senior level. And over time, you create a choice environment where all the dimensions of that environment, its physical characteristics, its cultural characteristics, its design characteristics, the information people have about these things, creates an environment where people start to make these choices without necessarily doing, as I said, that for, for, for ideological or, or political reasons. So I think where we are, and, and having witnessed this from both inside and outside the big organisations, I think in London, certainly now, we're in an interesting place where that dynamic is starting to kick in and we're getting those positive feedback loops between what the politicians want to do, what the institutions are capable of doing, and the environments that we're creating to make these sorts of choices seem obvious and everyday. Thank you very much.